Well, in part because of uh, Bible Bowl, we have some of our members who are away today, and some are traveling out of town for other reasons. And I know Jack mentioned our adults and kids that are participating in the Bible Bowl and prayed about that earlier, but I just wanted to add to that what a blessing it is to think about the great good being done because of the love for these kids, for the effort to get God's Word into their hearts and minds, and uh, what a joy to think that we can have young people be a part of something so positive and so faith-building, and that we have servants of the Lord in the church who want to do that kind of thing with young people and help them to know God. And so we pray that God is using that for His glory and for a safe return for everyone. So even though we have some of our members gone, I see we have some visitors in our midst, and we always pause to express appreciation. We're glad that you can be with us. I remember from long ago when I was looking for a church home and I really didn't understand the truth of the gospel and didn't know where I should be and, and was just visiting churches, it, it always felt a little uncomfortable and strange to go into a church where you didn't know people. Hopefully you know someone here and you have some connection, but we want you to feel comfortable. We want you to feel welcome. We want to help you to be sure that you know the Lord and that you are right with Him and have the hope of eternal life that he offers us in, in Christ. So let us know if we can do that. And then th that brings us to what I want to talk about here to lead into our lesson. There are different ways that you can describe <clears throat> what the Bible is about. There are different approaches you can take to summarize the Bible message. But we know the Bible tells us that God made us and that man sin rebelled against God and that sin separates us from him and so after the Bible story starts that way everything else in the Bible is about and really from the very first verse of Genesis the, the message of the Bible is about how God has done in his son what God has done in his son to rescue us from our sins and bring us back to him so that we can be reconciled with our creator and so all that God does throughout Old Testament history, all that God was doing in Israel to prepare for the coming of Christ, and in all that we see in Christ, God revealing himself to us in Jesus and bearing our sins on the cross, in his death and in his resurrection, God was doing all that because he wants us to be saved from our sins. He wants us to be in his presence now and forever. And so you can think of the Bible in that sense, that it reveals to us what God has done and is doing so that we can be saved from the guilt and consequences of our sins through Christ. But how is that done? How specifically does that get realized in a person's life? Well, one place we can go to see how that's done is in the book of Acts. And I've been teaching Acts on Wednesday night for some time. And as we've been looking at some of these, we call them cases of conversion in the book of Acts, there's something that, it, that, that keeps coming up in my mind that I wanted to address. And from time to time, I want to do some lessons from the text that we're studying in class. But when we, when we go to the book of Acts, we see that to save a soul, and this will allow me to segue into the title, right? Here's your title that you can write down at the top of a page, uh, at the top of the page in your notes. God sends a man with the message. Of course, I'm using man in the generic sense, like we have used it for ages, right? In the, the English language, the generic masculine, now that's considered by many inappropriate, but I wanted the alliteration, man with a message. I could have said God sends a person with the plan, but it just didn't sound right. So I wanted the man with the message there, but you get the idea. Uh, and a lot of Bibles have replaced where you have the Greek word anthropos for man, have, instead of translating it as man, have translated it as people, uh, the plural as people, instead of men, for example, because of that 
cultural shift. But you know what I mean. God sends a man with the message, and let me explain what I mean here, because what I'm focusing on in this lesson is not specifically what that message is as far as what we need to do to be saved, but how we, as God's people, play a part in getting that message to others. That's the focus. Not so much on the content of the message, but the way God operates in sending us with that message. That's what I want to look at. But first of all, let's understand the power of that message, the importance of it, that it's essential to hear the Word of God in order to be saved. Now understand this. The Bible does not save our souls. We're not saved by the Bible. We're not saved by Scripture. And what I mean by that is we're saved by God. We're saved by the grace of God through the death, through the atoning death of Christ on the cross and through the resurrection of Christ. That's how our salvation is made possible. But that salvation Jesus made possible that God offers us through Christ it's made available through the message that's called the good news. The glad tidings, older translations might say. The good news. That's the, the term translated gospel through the gospel of Christ. And it's not just hearing the message, but we're called to respond to that message in order to receive that salvation. There are a lot of passages that could come to mind. This is a verse, though, we should all know. Romans 1.16 where Paul sets up the thesis, I think, for that great letter, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, he says, because it's the power of God. So that message, the good news, is God's power because it tells us about the power of Christ on the cross and how that is realized in our lives. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So it, j just the fact of the gospel doesn't save us. We have to respond to it in faith. It's, it's the power of God for salvation to certain people, to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But to believe that message, we need to hear it, right? Romans 10, 17 tells us. And so that gospel is in God's Word. It's in the Bible. We're told, James 1, 21, again, I said we could cite many passages, but we're told to receive that Word. He calls it the implanted Word which is able to save your soul. So it, the Word of God does save us in the sense that it's an agency, it's a means that God uses so that we can be saved through the power of Christ and the cross of Christ. So the Word of God is essential. We see the importance of the message, the power of the message, and that's why, because that salvation is made available through the gospel, that's why the Lord has committed to us this mission to declare it to the world, to take it to the world. That's the point of what we call the Great Commission that you find at the end of the Synoptic Gospels. For example, we're familiar, probably most familiar with Matthew's account where after his resurrection, Jesus said to, the, to his disciples, these men had he trained and equipped to be his representatives and to go out into the world. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them. See, God sends out men with the message. He sends out men and says, go teach others, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and I'm with you. So the Lord is, is with this work. He's present in this work. It's how God is working in the world to save souls. It's one of the means by which God is reaching out and saving souls. I like Luke's account of it that we don't cite as much, it seems, but Luke tells us, Jesus said to his disciples, how it is written in Scripture that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed. See, again, that message of what God has done but, and then what we do, repentance. Now, Paul said the gospel is God's power to save those who believe. Here we learn that belief that brings salvation includes, it's a faith that produ produces change, repentance. 
It's a message we take to the world to not only hear what Christ did, he suffered for our sins, he was raised from the dead, but what we do in response to it. Repent so that we can receive the forgiveness of our sins. So this should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. And we could say, as in Matthew's account, to the end of the age, to all nations, to all people, through all time. They began that mission. We continue it. That's why Jesus gave it. Now, let's look at them carrying that out. And, and I'm, I'm bringing out a very specific point now as we go to three cases in the book of Acts I want to look at. So, several cases to consider here about how, in the will of God, we play a part in this process. All right? The first is a, a beloved account. We just looked at it in class. We went through Acts 8. Went through a verse-by-verse -verse study. It's a fascinating episode in church history that Luke sets out for us there. Where you have this nobleman in the court of the queen of a powerful empire called in Scripture Ethiopia. So he's basically the secretary of, treasurer, of the treasury for this queen of Nubia, we think it is. This is w what would be modern-day Sudan, but in the Bible it's called Ethiopia. And so here's a, here's a man, very powerful, a man of some status, and he's going back home to Africa. And God wants him to hear the message. So how does that happen? How does it go about? Well, he starts with a man. He comes to this man, Philip. And how does he do it? He sends an angel. So an angel of the Lord says to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now he's, been, he's up north of Jerusalem, so this is some journey he has to take. And he can't just jump in, you know, an SUV and stop at Bucky's along the way and all that. I mean, this, is, this involves considerable effort and commitment on his part. Go go down toward this way and it's a desert place this is a desert place so this was a difficult place and you think now why would God take me away I've been preaching the gospel in Samaria there are all these believers here this new community in Samaria and he's pulling me away and he's sending me out to some desert place and he doesn't tell them yet why the angel just says go there Philip so what did he do he went And along the way, I want you to think about this in these examples, that it, sometimes what, what's happening in our lives may not always make sense. Like, is this really the best place for me to be? But it could be a place where God is setting you up to use you to reach someone that he wants to be reached. Does it make sense to leave Samaria and go out to this remote place for one person? Well, yes. So he rose and went. And who was there? This Ethiopian. He was a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. So here's a very powerful individual. And he had come to Jerusalem, so he had traveled these hundreds of miles south of Egypt, all the way up to worship the God of Israel. And he was traveling home, seated in his chariot. He was reading from the prophet Isaiah. We talked about all this in the class. But now the Spirit is talking. First, Philip hears an angel. Now the Holy Spirit says to Philip, now he sees, oh, this is why I'm here. This is why God sent me all this way. Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him. And so this is very, I think it's a fascinating scene to think of him. I, I, I don't think this is like Ben-Hur where he's just flying down the road here, but he's moving along faster than you would walk, and so Philip's having to sort of run along, and he hears him reading from Isaiah. He hears him reading the scriptures. Very rare for him to even have a scroll and his own copy of scripture. And he says, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I unless someone guides me? See, here again we're seeing people need to be taught. Now, this is before the New Testament had been fully revealed and written, and I think a person can pick up his own Bible today and read it and learn and be taught that way from the Bible writers. But even so, we know still people need someone to guide them, someone to help them, and that's why the Lord sent Philip there. So we'll, we'll, we'll mention, we'll summarize some of the 
characteristics in common in, the, in these cases here in a moment. But God sent Philip down there to teach that man. Now look, look, look at what happens with Saul of Tarsus. I often call Saul one of the greatest, if not the greatest man, aside from the Lord who ever lived. And his conversion is one of the most dramatic and important things ever to happen in the history of the world. And it's recorded in Acts 9. You remember he's persecuting believers. He's a Pharisee. And he's zealous for God, but he's ignorant. He doesn't un understand that Jesus is the Messiah, and so he thinks these Jewish, his brothers and, and sisters in the Jewish community who are confessing faith in Christ as the Messiah, he thinks they're blaspheming, he thinks they're, they're in violation of the law of Moses, and so he's zealous in persecuting them, and he's on his way to Syria. He's going up to Damascus to find and imprison, to bind and imprison. And, and ultimately, he says later, he was putting to death. He was murdering Christians. But you know what happened, right? On the way to Damascus, Jesus appeared to him. And what did he say to him? Of course, and this is Saul who becomes the great apostle Paul. And he says, Jesus says to him, this, this bright light he sees and he falls down and he hears this voice in the Hebrew language we learn later, Acts 26, 14. It was in the Hebrew language or Aramaic that Jesus spoke to him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I wish I could say it in Aramaic. And he said, well, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now Jesus is talking directly to Saul. But he doesn't tell him the gospel. He doesn't tell him what to do in response to the gospel. Right? He says, rise and enter the city and you will be told what to do. Ah, you see, God still is going to send a man with the message. And in this case, it's going to be this disciple named Ananias. Paul later, in looking back and reflecting on this, will talk about how he was a devout man. He was a faithful man. He was well-respected. See, your faithfulness to God matters. God cannot use you in this way if you're not like Ananias, devout in your faith. He was a faithful man of God and so he was in a position to be used by God in an important way now Saul is going to become the great apostle Paul and the Lord's going to use him to bring the gospel to countless souls but first he needs an Ananias and so he said he sees a vision Ananias sees a vision and the Lord says to him, Ananias, he calls his name, and he says, well, here I, what does that remind you? Here I am, Isaiah, right, when he sees the vision of the Lord high and lifted up. This is common for a calling. Here I am. Here I am, Lord. That's what I need to say. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. And the Lord said, rise and go to the street called straight at the house of Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus, for behold, uh, Saul, behold, he's praying. And he has seen in a vision. So now he's already appeared directly to Saul. And he's spoken directly to Ananias. And he tells him he gave a vision to Saul. He's seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. And what happens? The same thing I, I, I failed to mention earlier. The same thing happens in the case with the eunuch. Philip taught him and baptized him. And Ananias goes to him and teaches him. And baptizes him. Why are you waiting? He says, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. But see, the Lord didn't tell him that. Even though the Lord spoke to him. He sent Ananias. And so Ananias, understandably, it has some concerns here. Well, well, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem, and he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Now, here again, we might look at a person and think, well, there's no way that person would be interested in the gospel. Ananias thinks, surely you don't want me to go to this man and talk to him. Again, sometimes what's happening people we encounter, it might not make sense to us, but we have to be always looking for those opportunities. 
because it could be someone that you would least expect who turns out to be the one who's going to be used by God in a great way. And that's what the Lord says. The Lord said, go, he's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. I'm going to use him to take the gospel. Think of the countless thousands whom God has saved through Paul in his missionary journeys, whom he used to write one-third of our Bibles. The Lord has profoundly affected your life and mine through what he revealed in Scripture through this man. And think of all the good that God accomplished through Paul. But it had to start with a man named Ananias. And so Ananias played a part in all the good that Paul did. Because, again, God needed the man to go with the message, right? But then here's another example. We're just following along in Acts. Then you go a little bit further. In the case of this Roman soldier, Cornelius the centurion. So it's 10 years since the day of Pentecost. It's 10 years since Christ was raised and ascended and the gospel has gone forth. And now it's going to go to the Gentiles. And the Lord is going to send Peter. But he starts here. You have God working with Cornelius, communicating with him. And then he's communicating with Peter as well. So Cornelius, we're told he was a devout man, he was a God-fearer, he wasn't a Jew, but he believed in the God of the Jews, he was respected by the Jews and the Jewish community, and God comes to him and he sees a vision of an angel, Cornelius, and he, he stared at him in terror, isn't that interesting? Most of the time when people think they've seen angels, and I'm, I'm not questioning people's sincerity, but I doubt these accounts that you hear, but it's always something warm and fuzzy and uh, pleasant, and he hears an angel, and he's scared to death, and that's usually what happens when God appears to people. He terrifies them first, and then tells them, be not afraid, (laughs) but he wants you to be afraid first, and then he'll calm you down afterwards, like when he appeared to the shepherd, and they saw the angels, and they were, they were afraid, and then they're told, all right, fear not, fear not, so he was in terror. What is it, Lord? He said, I want you to send for this Simon, who is called Peter. In the meantime, Peter's up on top of the house, right? We all go up to our rooftops to pray. He fell into a trance, and he saw a vision. I'm not going to explain the vision now. I'm not going to go into that in the context. And he's thinking about this vision, and then the Spirit talks to him. I'm making a point here. That's why I'm skimming through the text. But he tells him, look, there's some men coming here. I'm sending these men to you. You go with them, for I have sent them. So then when he gets there to Cornelius' house, he makes that journey, and Cornelius explains to him, so I saw this vision, and I sent for you at once, and you've been kind enough to come. Now now here's why God was orchestrating all this. This is what it all comes down to. We're all here in the presence of God to hear all that you've been commanded by the Lord. See, all of that. All that communication going on, all of that orchestration for a person to hear what God requires, to hear the message. Then later when Peter's telling the church in Jerusalem about how all this happened, he tells them what Cornelius told him, that he told us how he'd seen an angel stand in his house and say, send to Joppa, bring Simon who's called Peter. Why? He will declare to you, look at it again, a message by which... You will be saved. Jesus died to save Cornelius, but he had to hear the message. And how does God get the message to him? God doesn't announce it to him himself. He put that message in the hands of his people. Now bear in mind some summary statements here, and we'll bring this to a close. But this was a unique period in church history. And I don't think we should read these accounts and and think, well, okay, then maybe the Lord's going to send an angel to me. And and the Holy Spirit's going to talk to me and tell me, oh, uh, here I am at the terminal at the airport. He wants me to go over and talk to that stranger there. Or I'm going to get a vision from the Lord, and in this vision, he's going to tell me I need to go talk to my golfing partner next time we're out on the course and invite him to church and tell him, uh, I'd be happy to study the Bible with him. L- look, these are, this was a unique period 
where God, you have these miraculous elements in this apostolic period that I do not think, we don't have any indication that these were normative to continue throughout the church age. This period of miracles was at the time of the inauguration of the covenant. But my point is, and you've been hearing me make it all along, that even when the Lord was communicating directly to men through visions, through angels, through the Spirit, all this direct interaction with these individuals, even then, he did not directly himself tell these people, tell them how to be saved. So I've often wondered, why doesn't God just appear to everyone in the world himself? Why doesn't he just give everyone a vision? Why didn't I have an appearance of Christ to me? And why didn't, why didn't he just directly tell me about Jesus and about how to be saved? All the trouble of transmitting it through Scripture and, and preserving copies of the Bible and then translate all the tedious, arduous work of translating it into all these different languages and getting the message all around the world. Well, it might make sense to me that God could just appear to everyone. God could just speak directly to everyone. That's not His will. That's not how God has chosen in His sovereign will for us to be saved and how he operates. People, what do we see? They heard the gospel through God's people who were told to teach them, who taught it to them. You might say, well, I, I just always attended church. I was just brought up in the church. Many of you were. But I, I, I was not. I did attend church growing up, but I remember when someone came to me and taught me and whoever taught you, someone came to that person, or your parents, someone taught them, or someone taught their parents, or someone before that. And that's why we're here now. That's how God operates today as well. He's entrusted us with that message. It's God's desire that all people, there's that I mentioned earlier, all men, all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, the truth about Christ, that there is one God, the truth about God, and the truth about Christ. There's one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. To know the truth about Christ, about salvation in Christ. How we respond to the gospel of Christ. About the church of Christ. But if I can just pull it all together then, we see, and my point is, for the Lord to save the eunuch from Ethiopia. The Lord needed, and I put needed in quotes here because I don't want to think I'm so important to God that his will will not be accomplished. If I rebel against God or if I drop dead today, it's not as though I'm so important that God can't do what he's going to do without me. So I say needed in the sense that, in an accommodative sense, this is how God has chosen to work. And even if I rebel against God and turn from Him, He will still accomplish His will. He can call someone else if I fail. But I, you see though what I, what I mean, but given the way He set things up, He needed a Philip to go, right? For Saul of Tarsus, He needed an Ananias, and Ananias had to respond in faith. He had to go to a persecutor of the church. He surely was somewhat intrepid, fearful about this, right? But God needed an Ananias. He simply, God said, go, and he trusted the Lord, and he went. To reach Cornelius the centurion, God needed a Peter. And I say all that so that we can ask ourselves, for whom might the Lord need you? Who is it that the Lord might need me to go to, for whom I could be the Philip, I could be the Ananias, I could be the Peter I could be the one that says something that sets a person on a course that leads him to come to seek God and to understand his will. It, it could just be encouraging someone, offering to study the Bible or offer, inviting someone to a church service, talking about your faith, uh, offering to serve, trying to have an impact, have an influence in people's lives, but we have to be conscious of how God can be using us and looking for those opportunities and realize even if it's out in a desert way in some remote place or a person we wouldn't expect, even when we don't understand what's going on in our lives, we trust the sovereign God can be working in us 
to do His will, to reach those He wants us to reach. And see, that changes everything about how I think about what I'm going to do this week. And I hope it does for each of us as well. If you need to respond, see, one way we hear the message, it's not just in private, one-on-one teaching opportunities, but in the public proclamation of the Word, like in an assembly like this, where I proclaim Christ as the way of salvation. And, and we can continue that in a private session. If you need to learn more about how to respond to the gospel, we want to help you do that. Here's the message. What will you do? Let's stand and let's sing together.